Hello, my name is Naila Kalita May, and this video is entitled Histories of Representation in Canadian Theatre. I teach at the University of Waterloo and am an experienced artist and scholar in the areas of performance studies, critical race theory, gender studies, and autoethnography. There is a Jamaican proverb that, when translated to English, says, you can have all the education in the world, but if you don't have common sense, you have nothing. History is a complex and powerful act of storytelling, one that often implicitly decides the stories that are important and the ones that are not. For example, my public school education in the 80s and 90s in Toronto, Canada, taught me that Jacques Cartier and Samuel de Champlain discovered the massive land that many of us now call Canada. But common sense tells us that you can't discover a place where people already live. I can't walk into your house and then text back to my family and tell them that I discovered you and your home. When Champlain and Cartier arrived on this land, there were already people living here. A vibrant, thriving communities of Aboriginal peoples. They were and continue to be a peoples rich in culture, education, cosmology, and much more. I think of history as a highly creative endeavor, an exercise in storytelling that has traditionally been most often told from the vantage point of the community, privileged with the most access and opportunities available to tell their sides of the stories. It's incredibly useful to approach history with a strong dose of common sense. Instead of the word history, some artists, activists, and scholars use the term her story to draw attention to the stories of women who are often omitted in dominant historical narratives. They also use her story to de-emphasize the ways in which history or his story has traditionally been a male-centered, white European, middle and upper middle class project. Similarly, some artists, activists and scholars use the term histories to draw attention to the fact that there are a plethora of perspectives that the telling of one single story omits. Activists, artists, and scholars also pluralize the word so that it becomes histories, a term meant to problematize the implications of using history as a singular noun that suggests a singular authoritative truth. So there are numerous her stories and histories of theater on this massive land that we now call Canada. But before we embark on a survey of key moments in those stories, it is useful to pause and articulate some of the assumptions and limitations that come with the term theater. In a Canadian context, theater is most often used to describe an event that, among other things, features people acting in front of a live audience on a space understood by both the actors and spectators to be a stage. Theater also often includes the presentation by actors of predetermined words, a script, in conjunctions with wardrobe, set, and lighting designs that are conceptually led by a director. These theatrical conventions have their roots in white European cultures, and they are conventions that now extend to a wide range of non-white cultures and non-white European cultures that have been profoundly influenced by settler colonialism, in the case of Canada, and colonialism more generally. As it pertains to Canada, one of the limitations of the term theatre is that it does not capture the rich and robust performance practices of the Aboriginal peoples who were on this land long before the settlers, 
nor does it capture the rich and robust performance practices of the other non-white and poor white people who were forced to live in Canada as enslaved people, as laborers and indentured servants. Common sense suggests at least two things about the people who were oppressed by the practices of settler colonialism in Canada. One is that they still found artistic ways to articulate and imagine their lives and beliefs, regardless of whether or not any documentation of those practices exists as proof. And two, had they been able to successfully overthrow settler colonialism, we would have a wealth of information about their artistic practices. But, as I mentioned earlier, given that history is an exercise in storytelling, most often told from the vantage point of the community, privileged with the most access and opportunities available to tell their sides of the stories, what we have instead is a considerable amount of information from the perspectives of the settler col colonizers. So, here are some of what we know about the theater scene in Canada from the mid-19th century onwards. One thing we know is that New York City was considered the theater center of North America. And as commercial theaters in Canada grew in size and number, amateur theater companies decreased. By the turn of the 20th century, theater in Canada was inundated with French, British and U.S. touring companies that went to Halifax, St. John's, Quebec City, Montreal, Kingston, Toronto, and Winnipeg. There were theater agents, the formation of actors' equity, major theater producers, and the introduction of foreign stars. The influx of imported theater productions and foreign actors meant that, for a while, even the settler colonizers were displaced from main theater stages. And though we don't have much documentation to prove it, common sense suggests that Aboriginal peoples, other non-white people, and poor white people's artistic expressions continued to exist and were perhaps even further marginalized during this time. Throughout the 21st century, an amateur theater movement emerged that pushed back against commercial theater, international content, and a star system that threatened to take over theater in Canada. It was called the Art Theater Movement. One of the movement's key contributions was the construction of Hart House Theater at the University of Toronto. Hart House Theater is a theater that was only meant for non-Broadway work. By the 1940s, artists marched in Ottawa to advocate for the creation of government subsidies for the arts. And by the middle of the 21st century, the prime minister at the time issued a royal commission on national development in arts, letters, and science. The report's commissioner was Vincent Massey. Massey traveled across Canada, held more than 220 meetings, more than 114 public meetings, and met with 1,200 witnesses made up of artists, representatives from provincial agencies, representatives from radio stations, and the like. Representation is one challenge that faces any endeavor that seeks to record and synthesize the views of a large swath of people. So when we ask questions about representation, we're able to build a context within which to understand the possibilities and limitations of a report's findings. In other words, a question we might ask is, do the opinions recorded in the consultation process accurately reflect the sentiments of the diversity of stakeholders involved in the arts across Canada at that time? More specifically, whose opinions were sought in the consultation process? Who agreed to participate? And who and what was omitted? The central theme of the findings of the report was that the influence of the United States was deemed to be too strong. Artistic talent was leaving Canada for better opportunities abroad, and that Canada lacked what could be described as a distinct 
national culture. The idea of a national culture raises complex and revealing questions. When you hear the words Canadian culture, what are the images and sounds that come to your mind? When I say Canadian culture, who are the people that you imagine? What do you imagine them doing? How old are they? What are their ethnicities? What's their gender presentation? Some would argue that the idea of a national culture hinges on imagination, specifically a shared imagining of what defines a nation. Scholar Arjuna Padurai argued that imagination is a social practice that is part of a larger global process. He argued that imagination was not confined to geographical or state boundaries. Scholar Benedict Anderson argued that even in the face of inequality and exploitation, the nation continues to be imagined as a profoundly equal place. And it is, it is precisely these limited imaginings that Anderson argues have permitted people to not only kill, but also die in defense of the idea of a nation. Writer Azar Nafisi argues for what she calls a democratic imagination. She argues that a democratic imagination necessitates that citizens engage in the arts in order to expand and complicate the public sphere. In Nafisi's articulation, the public sphere is a space where politics, culture, and policy are engaged by informed citizens and informed residents. Massey's report has been widely influential in the development of theater in Canada in the last 60 or so years, and that's largely because Massey was able to implement its recommendations when he became Governor General shortly after the report was issued. Its recommendations resulted in the creation of an arm's length national arts funding government organization now called the Canada Council for the Arts, as well as substantive financial investments in universities across the country to create and bolster academic departments in the arts. And all of this was done with the aim of creating a distinct Canadian culture. But Many of these initiatives have gone on to face difficulties. For theater in Canada, the report led to federal funding for the construction of regional theaters across the country with the expectation that the existence of a theater would encourage the creation of theater. This model failed for a variety of reasons in different parts of the country. University arts departments have also faced challenges related to the broader public's understanding of the role of arts in society, as well as institutional and governmental budgetary strains. The Canada Council for the Arts went on to create an equity office and an Aboriginal arts office because proportional funding was not going to non-white and Aboriginal artists and art organizations. Decades of little to no funding for those aforementioned groups have impacted their opportunities for regional, national, and international growth. So this leads us right back to that question and those questions about representation. Who is included? And more importantly, who is excluded when information is gathered, recommendations made, and money allocated? Histories are contentious, multi-layered projects with wide-ranging impact on the present. One easy way to continue to think about representation in theater in Canada is to go to your local, regional, and national theaters. And when you go, pay close attention to who's on stage and in what roles, which playwrights are being produced, which directors are hired to interpret scripts? What are the seasons that artistic directors are choosing? And whose stories are being told? 
But most importantly, when you go to the theater, think carefully about whose stories and which stories are being omitted.